Andy, Barney, Opie, Goober, Floyd the Barber. That's some of the names from The Andy Griffith Show. Drop by Two Chairs No Waiting, The Andy Griffith Show Fan Podcast, and we'll visit with some of those folks, along with tribute artists and fans, and just all kinds of things related to The Andy Griffith Show. I'm your host, Alan Newsom, and you can find the show, Two Chairs No Waiting, at twochairsnowaiting.com or on iTunes. Howdy, partners. You're listening to Conversations with Jacob, hosted by my good friend, Jacob Waller. Make sure to check out the podcast where podcasts are available and check out the video version on YouTube. You can follow us on social media. Facebook is Conversations with Jacob. Twitter is at CWJ Podcast. And you can visit our website, Conversations with Jacob Podcast. Hey, you got a show idea? Maybe a guest suggestion? Email us at Conversations with Jacob at gmail.com. Now, here's your host, Jacob Waller. And what's going on, everybody? And welcome to another episode of Conversations with Jacob. Today is episode number 60, by the way. Um, and before we get to our guest today, um, I want to give a few announcements. Uh, 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 and as you heard in the beginning, check out Two Chairs No Waiting with Anna Newsom, uh, two, chair, two Chairs No Waiting.com. That airs at what, what he recorded every Monday at, at, uh, at 8 o'clock. Um, um, that's Eastern time. Also, if you like cars, uh, cars, Jeeps, old cars, check out the Rocky Mountain Cruise in 2024. Uh, the next cruise in is May 4th, 2024. You could check it out at the Franklin County High School, the, uh, the Lowe's parking lot, and the Rocky Mountain Smokehouse. Uh, that's, um, that's every, I think it's every, every first Saturday of the month. From 5 to 10 p.m. And also last week was the Blue Ridge of Jeep Fest in Stewart, Virginia. Uh, and my guest this week is Mr. Steve Post. Uh, Steve, how are you doing? I am great, Jacob. I appreciate you having me on your show. Look forward to our visit. Oh, absolutely. And now uh, for the people who don't know who, uh, for people who don't know who you are, I would how would Junior the lead pit row reporter for the Motor Racing Network and host of the Crew Call and also Wing Nation? Yeah, stay really busy. Been very fortunate with MRN, uh, been with the company. This will be the 22nd year uh, as we enjoy this season and uh, been really, really fun. So uh, get to work live races, love working the live races, love being part of a live sporting event. It's so much fun and I really love being on pit road. So wild down there What the what the athletes do. And then during the week uh, with, with Wing Nation, we talk sprint cars, with Crew Call, we talk uh, to crew chiefs and various other peoples in the, people in the NASCAR world. And so put it all together and uh, keeps me keeps me occupied for the better part of the weeks. Now and, how, now, and how did you get into broadcasting? Did you have someone that you looked up to when you was growing up? Uh, uh, and how did that come to be? Yeah, Jacob, uh, I have always been like a very pro radio person. I mean, when I was a kid, uh, when I was a kid, I would listen to, I was in Northeastern Pennsylvania and I could listen to the Cincinnati Reds baseball and the Philadelphia Phillies because they were on, at the time, not the brand clear channel. They were on what were designated clear channel stations. They were AM stations that had huge power. So I'm in Northeastern Pennsylvania and I could pick up Cincinnati, the uh, WLW, the big one there. So I've always been very pro radio and always enjoyed that. Um, and when I was a kid, um, I always, my dad always took me to the racetrack. And so I always loved listening to the announcers and I could mimic all of the announcers. I would set my matchbox cars up on the floor or on the kitchen table and i would announce races with the matchbox cars and i could i could mimic jimmy bevins who was the announcer at pen can speedway or dusty doyle who was the announcer at five mile point and so you 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 take my passion for for radio and love calling races and one sunday afternoon i have my transistor radio and i'm flipping through and i could not believe what i heard 
Um, and it was a station nearest I could figure. It was either Tuncanic, Pennsylvania or Elmira, New York. And I don't remember the call letters or anything else, but I heard NASCAR racing on the radio and I could not believe that there was actual NASCAR racing. So in the high tech world of my plastic transistor radio, I took a nail and scratched a little line right on that spot. So I knew about where to find the signal and would listen to the NASCAR races on the radio. Yeah, I would watch TV when we had them, when the Daytona 500 was on or anything with Wide World of Sports was on. So you kind of take that short track passion that I had and loved listening to announcers found out there was someone broadcasting races in radio and uh, started to focus in on it a little bit. So fast forward, I went to college, did all kinds of announcing and short track racing in, in, in Pennsylvania and upstate New York. And in 1995, made the decision that I was going to chase this dream. And I moved to North Carolina and uh, started uh, working PR. I did PR a number of years. Uh, Kenny Wallace was the first driver that I actually did PR with. And that's Plenty of stories in itself, I'm sure. Um, but ultimately, uh, in 2001, was able to get an audition with MRN. And in 2002, started broadcasting some races with MRN. And and the rest is history, they say. So there's there's not really a person. When, when I got to, got close to MRN, um, I would say, you know, Ken Squire, Barney Hall and Eli Gold were three guys that I leaned on, spent a lot of time with, especially once I got into MRN. I picked their brains all the time. Prior to that, it was just the passion for radio and racing and, and putting it all together and, and, uh, and, and finding my way. Now, you mentioned Kenny Watt. As a matter of fact, I was on the podcast a few weeks ago. Yeah, Kenny is wide open. My, my buddy Kenny... It's so funny with Kenny because we see each other probably once or twice a year. Um, he does a pre-race show. He does uh, the the live stage shows at at um, at some of the Speedway Motorsports tracks. So once in a while, I'll see him there. Once in a while, I'll see him at a dirt race. And then once in a while, and it's uh, for whatever reason, it's Sunday mornings. I'll be sitting around the house. I'll be making breakfast. I'll be doing something. The phone will ring. It'll be Kenny Wallace, and we'll talk for 15 or 20 minutes and touch base with each other. How are the kids? How are the family? And then we move on. Kenny is, uh, Kenny is, I, I wouldn't call Kenny a dear friend. Uh, we're, we're not close and that we do a lot of things together, but he is one of the dear, great people that I have met in the sport. And one of the, one of the people that I just, uh, uh, I consider him a friend within the sport, and I uh, and uh, and and love love what he's doing, and love what he's doing with with his YouTube channel and the the Kenny Wallace show. He's doing a he, he's doing a great job. He really truly is. Now, did you ever think uh, when you was growing up that you would be doing what you do now? No, no, no Jacob, not even close. I I did not only think I would be doing. I don't believe I dared to dream that I would be doing what I'm doing now. And, and what I mean by that, I think the, I think the, the MRN stuff, um, I think that would have been the outer fringes of my dream. Like, like getting to work with MRN would have been the ultimate, but then getting here and then being able to develop a sprint car show, because I love dirt track racing and be able to develop, um, my, my, my a, a blog site that I have, uh, with short track racing, Postman 68, and to be able to not only get my NASCAR stuff, my MRN stuff, but then to be able to, and, and then to be able to, to, um, to, to do a lot of short track stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate that I announced the summer shootout at Charlotte Motor Speedway and continue to do that and have watched the legends cars and watched the kids come up through there. I announced that Millbridge Speedway, I do indoor racing during the off season up in Allentown, Atlantic City and Trenton up in the Northeast. And, and uh, I, I, think, I think if you would have told me any of those singularly, I would have been very, very happy if you would have told me I'd put them all together, I'm like, oh, shoot, don't, don't, don't even, don't even tempt me with something that's not possible. So, uh, and the MRN is the foundation, and and I just love 
love being with MRN. I love working with the guys I work with, the, the company, everybody is so cool. Uh, MRN far surpasses the expectations. Like I said, I think MRN alone would be the outer fringes of the dream. And the rest of it is just all bonus and, and all the other stuff. It's uh, It's been an amazing journey. It really has. Now, uh, since you work with the Motor Racing Network, do you got a favorite track uh, that you like to go to? Yeah, my favorite place to go to and my favorite race to go to. So, I mean, I love going to new places. I love, uh, you know, the first time we went to the Coliseum, the first time we went to Chicago last year to the street course, getting back to North Wilkesboro was great. But year in, year out, my favorite event is the fall Martinsville race. Now, they've, they've enhanced it. They've, they've added it. It's the final cutoff race. But even before it was the final cutoff race, there is something about going to Martinsville, Virginia in the fall. Um, and it's just, you know, you're going to see a good race. They, Martinsville Speedway could not sell you a bad race. They just, it's just, it's, it's, the racing is always good. The thing that I love, and I, I love how, how tight it is. It's, 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 you're, you, you, even where we sit in the media center, you're on top of each other. So it's uncomfortable. You, you're down at where I call pit stops from. I can't see, but about two pit boxes because it's all on the corners. When you look at it from a work situation, it's like, it's not the most comfortable place in the world to go. When you look at it from a racing standpoint, one of my favorite things about Martinsville, you'll, I'm standing there and I'm usually down in turns one and two. And you'll be watching, and the next thing you know, somebody is running into somebody. And and then, and then two laps later, they're coming through turns and single fingers flying out the window, fists up in the air, and they're doing it. And you look up at the scoreboard, and it's lap 113. And you're like, if you are already this mad, you have got a long day ahead of you. That's what we get at Martinsville. I just love going to Martinsville. I think the other part about going in the fall is, is Martinsville is the one constant. In 1949, when they crowned the first champion in NASCAR, that driver had to race at Martinsville. Yes, it was a half-mile dirt track at the time. Same piece of property, same piece of real estate. And I just love the fact that every year in NASCAR, this is the 76th year of NASCAR that we're in now, every year – that champion had to came uh, had to try to conquer Martinsville, Virginia. So, uh, the favorite track year in and year out is Martinsville. I love them all. I love going to new places. I love going to old places. But one that I really love is the Fall Martinsville race. Well, I got to ask you about Martinsville. Uh, how, how many hot dogs have you ate for Martinsville? Oh my gosh, I don't know how many now. Now, Jacob, I started when I first went to Martinsville. I was one of those big quantity guys. I mean. And so I probably, I probably in my heyday, probably would do, I, I probably never made it to double digits in a day, but I probably did eight a number of times. So you take a three-day weekend. I was north of 20 over a three-day weekend. I know that. Um, I've, I've altered life now. I understand that, um, I understand that uh, eight Martinsville hot dogs is probably not the best thing for the waistline, the arteries or anything else. And so what I do with Martinsville now, and, and I think I enjoy the hot dogs more now than I did when I was devouring eight of them a day. I do two a day. I literally, I will pay $12 with me, which is three days enough for two a day. And I will do two a day and I pick and choose the battles. There's sometimes I'll do two of them at one time, sometimes just to enjoy the experience twice. I'll do one late morning and I'll do one somewhere along the way in the afternoon. So I'm a two a day guy and I love my Martinsville hot dogs. Um, I'll, I'll let, I'll let the kids, I'll let the ones with stronger guts. I'll let the ones that, uh, that, that, that work out at the gym. I'll let them do the big quantity. I'm just going to love my pair of Martinsville hot dogs every day. Now, uh, since you do a uh, pit reports, do you get a favorite driver that you like to pull for, or you know, or are you kind of open minded about it all? Very open minded about it all. I have I have people that I'm probably closer to um, at, as far as racing goes. Was very close when Tony Stewart was racing because we'd see each other at dirt tracks all the time and always enjoyed covering Tony. Um, so I, I don't really have a favorite. I 
I enjoy um, I enjoy there there are guys uh, Christopher Bell, Ricky Stenhouse Jr., Kyle Larson are the present drivers because of their dirt track stuff. I'll see them at a sprint car race. I'll see them at a dirt track. So we have we have mutual interests that we have in sprint car racing and dirt track racing in general. But but no real favorite. Um, you know, no no real favorite driver. I have I have uh, you know when when one of these people that 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 i i have a close relationship with i'll use christopher bell as an example when christopher won his first cup race it was at the road course in daytona it was down during uh the post-covid era um he won his first race and knowing christopher knowing his upbringing covering some of his micro races and sprint car races um that was just really cool to be there for his first victory lane and to be part of it but but really not a not a not a favorite driver per se there's just uh there's just been some neat moments with individual drivers that that the situation put us in that spot now and now and uh, what is your thoughts on barney hall because he was like oh it's in my opinion that I was in Barney Hall. Was like the was like the voice of uh, the Motor Racing Network. And what is and how and and what is your thoughts on him? Barney Hall. If if I, I, I shared earlier, Ken Squire, Barney Hall, and Eli Gold have all been very instrumental to my um, to my career. Uh, Barney is the one that I was the closest with. Jacob, I had the 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 most incredible twist of fate. Years and years ago, MRN was still based in Daytona Beach, Florida. I'm in Concord, North Carolina. Barney lived his life in Elkin, North Carolina, which was up in the up up in the mountains there. You know, you you know where that is. So um Barney was getting a little bit up in years, and there were these new services that were called uh, charter services that were starting to put teams. And we used to fly commercially, but then these charters would fly out of the Concord airport and there'd be, you know, guys from the different race teams on these charter planes. And so MRN uh, decided Barney, as he got up there and there's, we didn't need him slopping bags through Charlotte Douglas airport to go to Miami international airport or whatever it is. And so MRN uh, made an arrangement for Barney to be on one of the private charters. It, it was a, a, a total move of respect. Well, they didn't want Barney to travel alone. I was the only one in the Charlotte area because the uh, the rest of the crew was all based in Daytona Beach, Florida. And so I never, uh, the, our, our president at the time, David Hyatt, called me up. He says, I got a proposal I want to run to you. And I said, what's that? And he said, uh, he said uh, uh, I need you to fly on the private charter with Barney. And I'm like, okay, you know, usually, usually when there's a proposal, there's the here's the good side and here's the bad side. I'm like, okay, uh, is there anything else? And he said, no, that's what I need you to do. And I'm like, are you kidding me? So I had about two years time, Jacob, where I would on Thursday afternoon, arrive at the Concord airport, sit down in a seat next to Barney Hall, chat the whole flight there. I'd get the rental car and we'd go out to dinner every Thursday night together, just him and I, sometimes other crew members or other people would be around and we'd end up joining somebody. But in most cases, it was him and I, we'd ride back to the hotel. And then he always would say, he always called me boy. He'd say, boy, when, uh, what time's that garage open tomorrow? I said, Barney garage opens at seven o'clock. He says, sounds like we need to leave the hotel at 6.30, doesn't it? And I said, yeah, Barney, I'll see you in the lobby at 6.30. And so I had about two years where I had from, from about, two o'clock Thursday afternoon until we got to the garage. Once Friday hit, everyone else would show up and Barney would ride with the people that were in the booth with him and, 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 and that sort of thing. But I had that window of time and uh, Barney Hall, you, you know, MRN is known as the voice of NASCAR. Okay. And you said Barney Hall is the voice of MRN. Both of those statements are right, but I'll take it one forward. Barney Hall is the voice of NASCAR. Um, he just, um, iconic and beyond the voice, beyond the storytelling, Barney Hall taught every one of us in NAS, in MRN and in NASCAR that broadcast a couple of lessons. Okay. The first lesson is, and this is MRN. This is one of our hardcore tenants. Cover the race and you'll have a good broadcast. 
just just cover the race. Don't get into what's going on here, what this driver's doing off the track, what's going on. Cover the race, and you'll have a good broadcast. Barney's other tenement, tenant was, and this is, a, and especially now with social media the way it is, you have a thought, you have an opinion, you have a belief. A, does it need to be said? And B, am I the person that needs to say it? And it has saved all of us so much when, as we've, as we've rolled along with satellite radio and podcasts and, and social media, that premise has saved all of us so much hardship because we all have opinions. We're all humans, Jacob. We all think this, that, and the other thing. And when, when you have an opinion and I sit down and I'm ready to go on Facebook or X or Instagram, I'm going to state this. I go back to, does this need to be stated? And am I the one that needs to state that? And in every case, the answer to one of those or both of them is no, which keeps me from getting the wrath of whomever. And so Barney Hall, his impact on me personally, his impact on MRN, his impact on the sport of NASCAR racing is legendary. And uh, I am so fortunate to have had those experiences all those years where I traveled and then all those many years where I worked with Barney on the broadcast. He is, uh, he is a one on my list. Absolutely. I was, I was, I was, I remember, um, you know, it's been a few years. I was, I remember, was I remember, uh, 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 tuning in to the motor racing network to Barney Hall and Joe Moore. Yep. No doubt. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, Joe, 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 Joe was a dear friend too. Joe, uh, uh, we traveled together. Joe and I traveled together a lot. Joe, bless his heart. Joe Moore. I always joke around in NASCAR. I always joke around in motorsports that nobody gets out of it alive. And what I mean by that is you'll see somebody be like, I'm retiring. I'm done. And, and then two years, they're working on a car again and everything like that. Joe Moore is the one man who got out alive. Joe lives in the Florida Keys with his wife, Tiffany. He works for a little radio station down there, the, the Florida Keys AM morning radio station. He's the morning guy, which is great. I tuned in every once in a while, and I think, you dirty dog. You <laughs> dirty dog. And then, bless his heart, it gets to be about 10 o'clock in the morning, and Joe has to make the decision, am I going fishing in the Keys? Am I going scuba diving? Am I going to get a big old seafood platter? Uh, Joe Moore is the one that Joe Moore is the one that got out alive, and uh, Joe is just. Uh, I've had more fun with Joe over the years as well. I was, uh, and and Joe and Barney together were a really, really dynamic, great pair. Oh, absolutely! Now, one thing about uh, the motor, the motor racing network, um, here on the broadcast, and you guys can just do like a handoff uh, during the race. You know, uh, like one guy is, you know, going to be talking the next thing, another one pick up, and it'll just carry on and on. Yeah, it's it is unheard of in radio, and I didn't realize this. I just, I just figured this is how radio was done. Um, and and this is our turn, guys. I don't. I when I get to play turn guy, and I get to do that two or three times a year. Uh, I always marvel at how it is. And basically, what happens is, is that you basically have a drop point. So in other words, you have a point on the racetrack where you need to drop and the next person picks up and the next person picks up and around and around they go. And then the booth can steer it to pit road. The booth can steer to commercials. Booth can steer back to, or the booth can jump to the third, third turn position if something's going on there, but it goes around and around the track. I kind of thought that was normal. But over the course of time, uh, we've developed friendships with, with broadcasters in football and baseball and other sports and they'll come to the race and they're like, well, you know, when the, how does the producer tell you when to go? And we'll say, no, the, produ the producer doesn't tell us when to go. We have drop points. And this broadcaster, and I'm, and I'm talking, you know, guys that are doing Major League Baseball, uh, guys that are doing NFL for, for various teams, and they're like, wait a minute, the producer doesn't tell you when to go? No, this just happens inherently. And, and what happens is, is you get in the rhythm of it. Now, I'm, I'm one of those, I do three or four turns a year, and inevitably I start the day by apologizing to who's ever behind me because I'm going to carry it long at some point. I'm going to have more words in my vocabulary than time on the racetrack. Um, and we all do that. That's part of it. But where it really gets good is when you hear, 
you know, the booth throw it to Dave Moody, and Dave Moody does the perfect drop to Mike Bagley. And then Mike Bagley drives it, uh, drops it to Kurt Becker or Dan Hubbard or Kyle Ricky, and they drop it back to the booth. And when that goes around the racetrack, there is it, it is absolutely amazing what these guys do. The turn guys we have with MRN, and it is a it is a it is a skill set and it is an art that is not used in any other form of sports broadcasting. Um, but it's just uh, absolutely amazing what they do in 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 dropping the play by play, lap by lap of NASCAR races. And uh, it's uh, I, I occasionally just sit back and listen and be like, man, you guys. And when we have a really good finish to a race, I love every once in a while, Jacob. Someone will take when we have a really good finish to a race, and they'll do it on YouTube. They'll take a video. They'll mute the sound on the TV and overlay the MRN sound to it. And I love when that happens because it just showcases how talented our play-by-play, -play, our turn guys are. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And uh, Hannah, speaking of muting the TV and doing the MRN, um, I would say you do that, uh, you know, I would, I would say you do that every once in a while. Um, now, with you being a, a, a pit reporter, how tough of a job is that? Um, it's funny because I consider it, I don't consider it tough at all, but I, I'll say this. I work very hard during the week to get my notes together. I literally, before we recorded this podcast, I just sat here for 30 minutes, just going through drivers and, and, and their, their, their NASCAR history, their families, having all those details. So I work really, really diligently during the week on my notes um, I listen to a lot of interviews that they'll do, whether it's satellite radio or interviews on NASCAR Live or interviews we have. I listen to a lot of interviews during the week because when I get to the racetrack, I, I want to have that already in the bank, if you will, and get in that pit area, get in that garage area. And then a lot of times we don't see the drivers much in the garage area. They'll come to the media center and I'll sit in on some of their availabilities or when they when they do uh, media sessions. But I like to get in that garage area and, you know, and talk to the crew chiefs. And, you know, if a driver said something on Tuesday on NASCAR Live that makes me have a question, I like to go to that crew chief and say, hey, your guy said this, what, what does he mean? Describe that to me. I like to get in that garage and say, you know, what, what, what strategies do we have for the race? What is the game plan? What, what's your thought on tire strategy? What's your thought on fuel strategy? The stage breaks are here. What does that mean? Can you make it a full stage? And uh, I like to work the garage area like that. And then well, the, the, the fun part is when they say mics are hot and then we go green. Now, you know, I, is it a hard job? It probably is. Uh, I know when people follow along at times, they're like, I don't know how you do it. You do it. I don't know, but I know that I, I know that I put a lot of hours in on notes and studying. I know I put a lot of hours in the garage area, and I know there's times I'll look at my uh, my my step tracker and I'll have walked ten miles in a day. So I guess when you put it all together, I'm like, well, I guess it is a challenging job. But um, I don't know. I don't I don't I don't see much of a I, I see a challenge in it, but it's not a challenge that I don't love every day that I get to do it. Now, and what is your thoughts on the new cars? The new cars have been fascinating. It's been um, off off the top. The premise, I totally understand the premise of the car, and I know why we're doing it. I get it. I know why uh, the manufacturers are important. I understand that. On the surface, I tend to like a little bit more creativity. Uh, allow i tend to like i tend to like i tend to like to see what these uh, crew chiefs can do and figure out on the race cars but i get it that that gets into cheating and that gets into areas that are cheating and they're not cheating and this car has certainly tidied up a lot of that and nascar's enforcement policies have tidied up that a lot so i understand all of that and and really the the thing of it is is when they develop this car i'm like i don't know about this but we've seen it. We've seen it run on the dirt tracks. We've seen it run in the Coliseum. We've seen it run on street courses. We see it on super speedways and intermediates and short tracks. The thing, the thing is really, really diverse in there where it can run. Um, we we saw some issues early on with it, with some safety issues where where it was a little rigid. I think they've done a nice job adjusting that, and we don't seem to have those issues. It seems to be uh, significantly safer than it was. And so I think cars evolved into something. 
uh, that's really fun. The other thing, the one thing I just wholeheartedly love about the race car is what it's allowed some teams to do, like Front Row Motorsports. It's allowed them to become, it is it is increased. I, I talked to the very first race with this car a couple of years ago at Daytona. I talked to Michael McDowell. Um, and I said, you know, what's your take on this car? He said, what I like about it at Front Row Motorsports, he said, we leave the shop with the same car that Joe Gibbs Racing, that Team Penske, that, that, that RCR, that Hendrick Motorsports has. Now, we have the same parts and pieces, the same nuts and bolts, the same fenders, the same this and that. He says, now what we do with it and what they do with it, that's where we differentiate and that's where their engineering is better than our engineering or our team is smaller than their smaller their team is. But that has been a lot closer. We've seen that team in particular, Michael McDowell's team. I mean, he won Indianapolis and 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 dominated the race. But but he also the year before that was leading all those laps at Gateway. Um, I think that what I do like about it is is it's it's given some of those teams that never would have had all the same parts and pieces, never would have had because of engineering the latest and greatest. I think it's helped for that perspective. And so you see teams like them, you see teams like, um, like JTG Darty racing, um, you know, run, run better. Uh, Corey LaJoy is a driver that's, that's had some good runs. And I, and I do like that aspect of it. So that's a long and winding answer, Jacob, to, to say, I don't necessarily like, I, I like that. I wish they had a little bit more creativity with it, but I do think that there's been a lot of good with this race car. Did you ever think that NASCAR would go to racing on the streets? Nope, never saw that one coming at all. Never saw that coming at all. And Chicago last year was insane. I've <laughs> joked around about this. I've said this. I think we all need to be grateful that it monsoon rain because if it didn't monsoon rain, it would have taken us two weeks to get out of there. And because it monsoon rained and the crowd was massive. Everywhere you look, Jacob, everywhere you look, every building down Michigan Avenue, down on the south side of the courts, on the north side of the courts, every building had people on top of it, in balconies. We, there was people on awnings of buildings, sitting on awnings, wanting to get a look at NASCAR. And I just think that that was such a high moment arc of our season. This car has allowed us to go run street courses. And it was, I, I, I hope we go back there in July that we have good weather because I want to see how the car performs on a, on a dry, dry racetrack. But um, this car has allowed us to do that and allowed us to take us to scenes like that. I never in my life dreamed I would see that. I never, you know, in, 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 in a complete honesty, Jacob, when, when it was announced and we had all of the naysayers, oh my gosh, what are we going to do about this? And what are we going to do about that? And oh, Chicago doesn't want us there and make sure you don't get caught up in something you don't want to. I arrived and the first stop I did, I went to a CVS store. Okay, I needed to get something. I forget what it was. Something probably, probably forgot a razors and things like that. I go to a CVS store and something with MRN on. I go up to the checkout and the woman there, and she was a middle-aged African-American woman. Okay, not the demographic that we put together with NASCAR. Okay, she said, are you with NASCAR? And I said, yes, we broadcast the race mail. She says, oh my gosh, this is the greatest thing that has happened to our city. She, and I said, oh, are you a race fan? She says, no, I have no idea what it is. She said, but the energy, the excitement, there's so much going on. So many people are coming to Grant Park that have never been to Grant Park before. This is the greatest thing that's happened to our city. And I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. That's not what this person told me. And that's not what this person said. And I read this story about this. And all we saw in Chicago was people embrace NASCAR. And when we went green on Sunday afternoon in that rain, there was people hanging off from hanging out of windows in every building there. Uh, it, it was it was so exciting. And and the thing of it is, is what that race and what the Coliseum does, it opens us up to go to other places. I don't I don't want this thing to be 38 street races. I don't want this thing to be 38 Coliseums. But a Coliseum, an indoor race, a Coliseum, a street race, along with North Wilkesboro, along with Daytona and Martinsville and Texas and all of this, I love where this is going. I love last year, Jacob, because we took NASCAR to a street race in Chicago and we returned NASCAR to North Wilkesboro. 
Now, I'm telling you, if you're an old school NASCAR fan, you might not have thought much of the street race, but you thought it was pretty cool when we had that all-star race at North Wilkesboro. And if you're a new fan, North Wilkesboro means nothing to you. But man, it was cool when we were in Grant Park. So I love where we're at with that and the street racing, street racing. I, I, I look forward to I look forward to Chicago this year and I look forward to seeing what's down the pipeline as well. Do you think with NASCAR going to uh, North Wilkesboro, they will open the, uh, up the um, the choice, I guess, to bring back uh, to bring back some old tracks uh, like Rocky Ham? I think that I think that um, Rockingham is an interesting story, and and I, I think that one of the challenges Rockingham has, and, and there's rumors all going around about it that that this may change, is that. You, you've got to have the right ownership group in place that has the connections and ties. You know, the, the reality, North Wilkesboro happened because Speedway Motorsports owned it. And Speedway Motorsports basically took the all-star race from Texas and moved it there. Speedway Motorsports is not going to take the all-star race and give it to somebody else, nor are the NASCAR-owned tracks and everything else. Now, what happens here? Are there lease situations? Now, we saw that. That's what Coda is. Circuit of the Americas is a lease situation that Speedway Motorsports does with that racetrack. So do we see someone Rockingham? I don't know. The other challenge with Rockingham is just its location. It's like how where do we do we get back? Do we get back to too many races in the southeast? Um, I'm a fan of it. I love going to Rockingham. Uh, when they opened that thing up for the truck race, I was the first one on the property. I mean, I broadcast both uh, those, those truck races down there. I loved it. I love Rockingham, but I'm not sure where it fits in overall. I think I think that uh, put it this way: five years ago, if you'd have said the hope of a NASCAR Cup Series race at Rockingham, I'd have put the probability at zero. Nowadays, I have no idea what it is, but it's not zero anymore. So I, I'm not sure. I think um, I, I think that I. I think that we continue to be in fascinating times as to where we take this. I, I think, I think the the example we have, and not that it's as historic a track, I think it's really cool. We're going to Iowa this year. I think that's fantastic that we're going to Iowa. So, I I at one time would say never. I am now I'm never say never because I don't know. Now, um, by the time this episode comes out, you know there would be a, you know there would have been a few ratings already completed, but. Uh, and who do you think is going to do good this season? It's going to be interesting to see. I think uh, I think the the Ford with the new Dark Horse Mustang, uh, how that's performing. And and you're right. By the time this airs, we'll have a little bit of a feel for what that is. There's also new Toyota, uh, the, the the new body on the Toyotas, and how well they've adapted, how well they perform. But when we looked at last year, Fords were not good during this time of the year. Uh, Ryan Blaney won the Coca-Cola 600 was kind of like their first moment, but then we saw, especially that the Roush Fenway Keselowski Ford got good. So, uh, it's better who gets good at the right time. And then Ryan Blaney got great at the end. So I think we're a long ways from figuring that out, but I, but I will say this. Okay. I shared earlier about, I think it's great that front row Motorsports and JTG and Spire and all these people. I think when you look at the championship, when you look at the end of the year, when you look when we get when we get to those final couple of rounds, I think there's going to be some Hendrick Chevys. I think there's going to be some Gibbs Toyotas, and there's probably going to be a Penske Ford or two in there. Now, are there others? Are there other teams that have stepped up? I think RFK is an interesting story on the Ford side because they've gotten really, really good. But I still think it comes down to those teams are probably going to put people in the hunt when it comes to later this year so so i don't know i'm I, i'm it, it, you know we're we're way out on this thing i think a guy like martin truex jr could uh he's he's getting to the stage where he's got fewer years ahead of him than he has behind him uh he had a tremendous season last year i know i chatted with martin before the season started earlier this year and man he is one pumped up race car driver Maybe him, maybe I, I think Christopher Bell is a guy that's going to be a multiple time champion in our sport. Well, if you're going to be a multiple time champion in the sport, you got to win that first one. And I wouldn't be surprised if uh, C Bell or someone like that, but you know, who knows if you'd have told me, if you'd have told me at the beginning of the playoffs that Ryan Blaney would be our champion, I'd, I'd have called you out on that. And that's just the, the, the fun format that we have right now. Now, and what was your uh, thought or what was going through your head when Ryan Newman had that big crash at Daytona? 
Oh gosh. Um, what made it? What, I mean, we we have big crashes at Daytona. Um, we saw one. You know, the Ryan Newman crash. You referenced that. We saw one with Ryan Priest in in August of last year. We have big crashes at Daytona, and in most instances, the driver just climbs out of the race car. Uh, that's not what we had. So, so the crash is one thing. Okay, where it got really, really bad with Ryan Newman was he wasn't climbing out of that race car, and then you saw all the medical personnel, all the safety personnel. And then you had drivers coming out of the care center saying, that's not good. That's not looking good. That's not looking good. We didn't have those. We didn't have those warm fuzzies afterward. The crash is one thing, but the after effect of it. And, and in complete honesty, uh, at, at points during that time period, um, many of us were thinking this might've been the worst. Uh, this, this, we were, we were thinking this might've been the worst later on. Um, we were in the lobby of the hotel. A couple of us MRN guys were, and the tweet came out because we were Twitter then we're not X. We were Twitter back then. Uh, the tweet come out that he was alert, uh, to whatever it was in the hospital. And I don't remember in serious condition and everything like that. And we were about dancing, you know, because it was not what we thought that update might be. Um, and, and it's, and it's fascinating. This, this, this sport evolves all the time. Uh, the, 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 the one bar that, that maybe saved his life was a change from a couple of years ago when he took a tumble. It was called, it, it was joked around the garage called the Newman bar. And then there was another Newman bar added after that. And so this sport evolves. And, and the good news is, is that Ryan has been able to evolve with it and make a lot of starts winning that's our championship. And, uh, and, and now, uh, he's out at Millbridge Speedway with his daughter racing. And, uh, that's, that's really good to see. So, uh, but the aftermath of the Ryan Newman, the aftermath of the Ryan Newman crash at Daytona was not a fun aftermath at all. We were, there was a lot of concern about it. Uh, or a lot of, lot, a lot of happy people that we got that tweet that Ryan was, was, was doing relatively all right in the hospital. And the thing is, um, two day, two or three days later, and you walked out that hospital. Well, then that was the thing we went from, we went from thinking the worst to Sunday night, getting some good news, getting great news. Okay. Now we still knew we had a long road to go. And then a day or so later, seeing him walking out of the hospital with his, with his daughter. I mean, it's like, whoa, we went from, we went from rock bottom in about 36 hours to this is the greatest thing ever. And that was, that was so neat to see. It really was. Oh, absolutely. Now, where can people uh, find you on the internet? Um, a couple of different places. Uh, my social media um, Postman 68, uh, is where I'm at on X, uh, Postman 68 on, on Facebook as well. I have a page there that I do stuff with. I actually have developed and, and continue to develop a, uh, blog site called postman68.com. 68 was my favorite driver as a little kid. Pete Cordes was my favorite driver as a kid. So I, I use Postman 68 in a lot of my, uh, a lot of my social media. I couldn't get Postman 68 on Instagram. So I'm Steve Post 68 on Instagram. Uh, but you can follow me along with all the social channels and just Google and you can find it. Um, also developing a, uh, a YouTube page. Uh, I've got a couple of videos on there. Uh, that is just telling some short track stories and telling different stories. So, uh, Postman 68, you, 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 you find that and you can uh, track me down there. All right. Uh, for the people that's listening that want to tune in to some motor racing network shows and broadcasts, and where can they do that at? Okay. MRN.com is where you can find your local station, or you can go on the NASCAR app on their, um, on their live scoring. And there's the scanner and hit the scanner button and you'll see all the cars listed, but up at the top, it says MRN and you just click on that and you can get it right on your phone. I always joke around. I'd say this right here, this phone, this is your dad's transistor radio. And so, except for it doesn't have the static. It doesn't have the static like your dad's transistor radio. But yeah, the MRN app, you go on the scanner and click on it. When I'm when I'm not at a truck race or an Xfinity race, I listen on the NASCAR app. Um, I'll, I'll probably also listen Sirius now has an app, and I just got that as well. But I'll listen on the NASCAR app. And when PRN has races, I'll listen to them on the NASCAR app. So uh, that's probably the best place to listen. Or you can go to MRN.com and find your local affiliate. 
uh, support those local radio stations. They're the ones uh, we appreciate them carrying the races as well. So uh, that's how you would find it. Uh, all right. Uh, towards the end of the podcast, I uh, was ask every guest if they have a closing thought. So do you got a closing thought? Closing thought is, is I love that you're doing this podcast, Jacob. Um, I remember when I shared with, I shared with you about my story, um, back in the day, there was one way to get into motorsports broadcasting. And that was to maybe do a racing show on a local radio station that maybe was an MRN affiliate where somebody would know, somebody would know, somebody would know somebody that maybe you could get to the racetrack and maybe you could meet somebody with MRN. And then maybe if that meeting went well, you could get an audition or you could send a cassette tape of yourself to MRN and maybe the right person would listen to it. Not complaining, not whining about the road that I went on. It was great. But I absolutely love where we're at right now, where Jacob can do a podcast, Kenny Wallace can do a YouTube channel, Steve Post can do Postman 68 videos, and we all get a chance to uh, to enjoy it. And so I love that you're doing this podcast, uh, your your conversation podcast, whether they're with motorsports people or, or anybody. I'm a I'm a huge podcast fan. I don't I don't own a television. Well, that's changed a little bit during the off season. My daughter's moved one in my living room, and between Flow Racing and Dirt Vision, I do have a television now that I watch races on, but streamed races on. But um, I love podcasting, and I love that that. The, the guys like you, guys like me, if we want to if we want to put something out there, let's put it out there, see if we can cast a net and get an audience and see what we can do. So that's my closing thought is just I really appreciate, Jacob, you having me on your show. And I certainly uh, love what you do here and certainly wish you wish you continued success as you as you continue to roll through these. Oh, how I greatly appreciate that for sure. Um, so, uh, so, so Steve, what's I want to thank you for coming on to talk about your career and NASCAR. Always, I really appreciate it. Appreciate it, Jacob. Thanks for having me on. Of course. All right. Uh, that wraps up episode number 60 of Conversations with Jacob. Tune in next week uh, for another interview. Until then, uh, um, until then, uh, um, God bless and we'll catch you next Monday.